actually he's married to Cindy. Uh, Okay, I think we're going to get started here, so if everybody wants to put their phones on mute, like I am, otherwise you can donate money to the local 4-H if it goes off, I suppose. How much? Uh, 20, how about? So that's why you all got your warning right now. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Callie Thorne. I'm originally Callie Wold from this area. I'm the Mackenzie County Extension Agent, and we know that there's a little bit of action going on here with the oil boom and stuff, so Marsha and I want to put this program together. Marsha's in the back. Many of you know her. Marsha Helen Sauce, the FCS agent up at the courthouse. Um, so I'm going to begin. I'm going to be very quick because some of you have seen this presentation before. This is about the fourth time I've done this, and you guys are going to use the clickers for this. Um, I'm going to guess that not everybody's is going to work, but we tested some of them earlier and it did. But I'm going to go through and just ask you guys a few questions on this, um, and then we're going to read through a quick little story, and then we've got a few other speakers here today. So um, if you ever need a break, though, coffee will be coming out shortly. Cookies, bathrooms are in the hallway there, so get up to move if you need to. So um, we're, I'm not going to talk a whole lot on this, but it'll kind of get your mind going on some of the positives and negatives that we've been seeing because of the oil boom out here. And a lot of other times we've talked a little bit what is Extension's role and what can we do, but we're not going to take quite as much time here, but we'll kind of see where the discussion leads today. Okay, so if you look, this is your first question for those of you that have the little clickers. I think I know how to work this, so if your answer is yes, hit a one. And it might blink green for you. Um, see, the fun thing for me is up there, do you see the number of responses is going up? So, so far, 24 of you have answered. And you can hit it more than once. It's going to take your last answer. If you don't know what you're doing, you can hit two, hit no. Um, but I'm trying to think. I have no idea how many we've got here. A little over 50. 83. And again, just hit it a few times. Um, and it's just reading it up here. You don't even have to point it up here or anything. But we're up to 38 now, 39. So I just want to get kind of an idea how many we've got here. 40, 41. I think we got 50 clickers. 50 clickers out there, so we'll call that good. Okay, so 93% of you know how to work the clickers. That's good. But the fun thing about this is we can keep it kind of anonymous. So when I get to some trickier questions that are coming up, um, you can actually answer them without the group knowing how you're answering. And a lot of this pertains more to those um, farmers, ranchers, landowners, those who are heavily involved with the oil boom that way. So if a question doesn't pertain to you, you don't have to answer it, okay? Okay, so here's your first question. The oil boom has hit number one. If it's completely changed your way of life, a high impact, daily life has been changed. Two, somewhat of an impact, maybe your job or something similar. Three, very little impact, or four, what oil boom? <laughs> See there, we've already got 42 clicked in. We might go with that. And we won't take a lot of time to discuss that, but that's kind of what I figured. Um, they actually held a similar meeting yesterday in Crosby where they had a little over 100 people attend. And then we're doing it in Watford today, and tomorrow they're going to speak again briefly down in Bowman. And so we know, you know, it varies quite a bit, Crosby, Bowman versus what's going on right here in Watford. So um, I knew we'd have a one and two here. I'm glad we have oil in our county. Yes or no? Yes, twice. And again, you can click it more than once just to make sure your answer got in. It's only going to take it one time. But it seems like we've typically got about 40 two-ish answers. Okay, so it's about three-quarters of you are glad, and a quarter of you wish it was not here. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Oil or other, whether it's gas or because you've got land or whatever the case may be, um, has made a positive impact financially in our life. Yes, now wait till you read them all. Yes, we receive some sort of income and love it. 
Yes, we receive money, but it's not worth it. In other words, you'd give back all that money if you could. Or three, the impact has done nothing for us. We're just still living here in Watford and not benefiting in any way. We don't have oil pads on our land or nothing. There's no sort of oil check coming to us or gas or whatever it might be. Okay, that's good, typically. Although 30% is still kind of high, and, and it's been interesting. We've seen different results, because like I've said, I've done this with a beef, um, mainly beef producers too. There was about 15, 20 of them. I've done it with some, I want to say it was Farm Bureau, um, and I also went out to Squaw Gap and did it with about 15 people. So it's fun to compare the results, even within our county, you know, Squaw Gap versus Watford City and the impact they've seen. Is it usually more, yes? Yeah. What was my question? It, no, it, oh, received my, um, not necessarily, no. Maybe with um, my beef producers, you know, most of them had some sort of money they were receiving and stuff, but like Squaw Gap was a lot less there even. Um, the oil boom has how affected your farming and ranching operation? If it doesn't affect your farming and ranching operation, you don't have to answer, but has it positively, negatively, or has there been some of both regarding your farming and ranching operation? Or, I guess, you can put that it has not affected you. Although I think if you have a farm or ranch in McKenzie County, it somehow affected you. Okay, so a little bit of both, but more, a lot more negative than the positive. We will continue to farm and or ranch even within the midst of the oil boom. So those of you that are farming and ranching or if you know your kids or your family well enough, you know, go ahead and click in. Yes, we aren't going anywhere for a long time. Or number two, yes, but once we retire, there's no one to take over. Or three, we've been looking at selling. We're looking at getting out of it. And it may or may not have to do with the oil boom, so. That's always good to see, kind of. Just over half aren't going anywhere for a long time. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of a change we don't see just here, right? Agriculture in general, it's getting harder and harder for young people to come and take over, or what do they say, that the average person is now three generations removed from the farm, so that's just a huge change um, we're seeing all across the U.S. We plan to live here, as in McKenzie County or wherever you live, for the rest of your lives, oil boom or otherwise. Are you guys going to stick around, you think? Yes, Western North Dakota for life, hit one. Two, we're planning to get out of this chaos. Or three, you're just not sure what you want to do now. That would be a big change for you to up and leave, whether you've been here for generations or, or Watford's changed a lot, so you're just not sure what you want to do. Okay, those are some interesting numbers even. You know, not even half of you are definite yeses. We've got about 21% that say you're ready to leave here. And just about 40% are kind of questioning what they're gonna end up doing. I think the oil boom is here to stay. Or do you think it could up and go in a few months or even a few years? Okay, I'm always kind of surprised at those numbers, but I think maybe what Jean has to share, um, some of you, some of the things I think a lot of you um, maybe haven't heard some of the things we're going to talk about today or some of the numbers and things like that. So um, a lot of times I, you know, being younger and growing up here my entire life are still kind of different and difficult to hear or hard to believe even the numbers we hear and the numbers we see of what's projected, but um, Jean will cover some of that a little bit later. I'm very open to all of the changes that have been taking place. And be honest, have you been very open to all the traffic, the new people, 
the changes taking place. Okay, that's good, I think. Sometimes I think um, the knolls are usually a lot higher that they're not open to the changes, but I think it's almost been here long enough now that um, I think if we think about it, we know there's nothing we can do about it. So we can either change our own attitudes or, or leave, I guess. If I could go back to the way things were pre-oil boom, I would. One yes, two no. And think about what that means. That means no traffic, no long lines at the post office, no waiting at the grocery stores. But that also means no money. Um, no money <laughs> for a lot of people, you know. So there's definitely positives and negatives. So if you had to choose, if you could go back to the way things were, would you? You'd give it all back. Okay, so about 40 and 60%. 60% said no, you wouldn't go back. Even with all the changes it's brought. But you look at it the other way, that's pretty impressive too, that 43% of you would go back. You'd give it all back to have it back the way it was. And this was just a picture I'd always show at the end. I found this online. This was from the year I graduated from Watford in 2005. And the caption below it was, A Busy Night in Watford City. This is Main Street. And you can see um, Outlaws, the new restaurant, was just getting built and stuff. And there's Five cars on the right hand side and maybe a couple over there and then there was the old come and go looking south and stuff and that that was the caption somebody was visiting here and they were kind of making fun of this is a busy night in Watford City and then those are just some current and there's even more current ones than that so um, and I just wanted to read this really quick to you and we'll move on to the next one just so we know this isn't just a complaining session or anything but I think this was kind of a fun little story um, some of you have heard it before. I know some of you carry it with you now daily, or it just makes you think a little bit more. So I'll read it to you guys quickly, and if you didn't get one, you can pick them up on the back table. But it's called, What's It Like in Your Town? Once there was an old and very wise man. Every day he would sit outside a gas station in his rocking chair and wait to greet motorists as they passed through his small town. On this day, his granddaughter knelt down at the foot of his chair and slowly passed the time with him. As they sat and watched the people come and go, a tall man, who surely had to be a tourist, since they knew everyone in the town, began looking around as if he were checking out the area for a place to live. The stranger walked up and asked, So what kind of town is it that we're in? The older gentleman slowly turned to the man and replied, Well, what kind of town are you from? The tourist said, In the town I'm from, everyone is very critical of each other. The neighbors all gossip about everyone, and it's a real negative place to live. I'm sure glad to be leaving. It's not a very cheerful place. The man in the chair looked at the stranger and said, you know, that's exactly how this town is. An hour or so later, a family that was also passing through stopped for gas. The car slowly turned in and rolled to a stop in front of where the older gentleman and his granddaughter were sitting. The mother jumped out with two small children and asked where the restrooms were. The man in the chair pointed to a small bent up sign that was barely hanging by one nail on the side of the door. The father stepped out of the car and asked the man, is this town a pretty good place to live? The man in the chair replied, what about the town you're from? How is it? The father looked at him and said, well, in the town I'm from, everyone is very close and always willing to lend their neighbor a helping hand. There's always a hello and thank you everywhere I go. I really hate to leave. I feel almost like we're leaving family. The older gentleman turned to, his father, or turned to the father and gave him a warm smile. You know, that's a lot like this town. Then the family returned to the car, said their thank yous, waved goodbye, and drove away. After the family was in the distance, the granddaughter looked up at her grandfather and asked, Grandpa, how come when the first man came to, into our town, you told him it was a terrible place to live? And when the family came into town, you told him it was a wonderful place to live. The granddaughter lovingly looked down at his granddaughter's wondering blue eyes, and he said, no matter where you move, you take your own attitude with you, and that's what makes it terrible or wonderful. So I think that's a pretty fun little story, and you might think of Watford quite a bit um, when you read this story. And so feel free to keep this or share it with others. And, um, just kind of keep it in mind as we go throughout discussing our meeting today and stuff. So, with that, um, do you guys have any quick questions for me or we'll move on to the next speaker? Um, next up, we're going to have then, um, Dale Enerson is going to be up next.
He's originally from Stanley area. He's now in Jamestown and he's with Farmers Union. Um, but he's going to talk a little bit today. He's a mineral and landowner, and so he's going to probably connect with a lot of you guys and uh, just kind of give us an update there and a feel for what he's been seeing and things. So let's welcome Dale today. State Farmers Union office uh, in Jamestown. Been there about 10 years. And my son uh, farms our, our operation. We're actually about uh, 10 miles north of Ross. And uh, part of my job at North Dakota Farmers Union is working with co ops around the state. And we have about 130 co ops that I help with financial audit reports and board training and uh, board planning and so forth here. So that's been a big part of my job. But interestingly, being a native of this area, folks from the rest of the state, now all of a sudden the questions are, well, what's it really like out west? Is it really as bad as people say? Are the roads as bad as you say in all of this? So at North Dakota Farmers Union, and if any of you uh, get our little magazine, uh, we've been featuring some kind of oil field education for folks. Uh, we've been involving Dave Sikowski, who's one of our speakers this afternoon, kind of some question and answers, so I hope you get a chance, if you haven't looked at that, uh, some of the issues that are happening uh, out here in western North Dakota. Uh, as we'll show in just a minute here, the other thing, of course, uh, most of you know the North Dakota Farmers Union for years has had a tour bus for calling kids to camp and folks to various kinds of co-op meetings. We have brought seven groups of people out here in the last uh, couple of months People from the rest of the state want to come out and see what does the oil boom look like. And uh, all of those trips have been full, waiting lists, and we got about another seven or eight trips this spring. So the rest of the state is interested in what's going on out here. And I think it's important because you folks, including my region of the state, kind of the <coughs> western third, we're the legislature right now telling folks, you know, that yes, we need to share the wealth and do some of our infrastructure needs as well as the needs of the rest of the state. And I think the more people we can get out here, the, uh, the better they're going to understand what we're doing. I want to take just a few minutes to kind of set the stage for our uh, two other speakers this afternoon. You know, when you guys go to a high-priced concert, you know, you don't see the main act right away. You have to kind of put up with a, with a warm-up band and so forth. So I'm fulfilling that role here today. So anyway, we'll just take a few minutes and uh, share with you some of the things that I see that's happening with our uh, Farmers Union or general farm and ranch families in North Dakota. So if we could get this to work here. Uh, I guess uh, nothing new with uh, seeing an oil rig. We have about 200 or just about 200 rigs operating in North Dakota. And every month we're producing uh, another couple hundred oil wells. And if you think about it, behind that oil well, there's lots of folks like you probably that are going to get a little piece of royalty out of that. So it has a huge impact. But before we all feel really smug about that, you know, one of the things that I always used to do in, in my former life here before Farmers Union and when I was farming and I taught adult farm management to a lot of folks for a number of years, it was always important to kind of think back if we have a big success on our farm. Was it something that we really did well because we managed it? Or was it dumb luck? And in a lot of cases, we all think that the oil is a big deal, but really, when we think about it, it maybe gets down to where your grandfather homesteaded, what part of the state he stayed in, where it came from, how was he able to keep those mineral acres, uh, how has your family in three and four generations uh, handled those mineral acres to get you to the position today that you maybe have some mineral acres that are worth some money. So we have to kind of think about this all along. And of course, in the oil country, just like in the rest of life, we have a lot of haves and have-nots. People who have family mineral interests now are booming, but a few years ago, these were practically worthless. So, you know, all of a sudden, the values has, has really changed. So let's just take a few minutes. 
Uh, of course, you've all seen various maps, uh, you know, of, of the oil industry in North Dakota. And uh, I just wanted to show you, there's actually a bigger area than this, but the really hot area in terms of drilling and leasing and pipeline construction and all of this is kind of your area, McKenzie County, Montreal County, Williams County. We had a meeting like this yesterday up in Crosby, a lot of interest up there. And we're also seeing that this really is moving south. But as Dave Sikowski, our speaker later this afternoon, uh, his family owns uh, acres out of the uh, out of the darkest area that part of the state probably will benefit eventually but under the current economic situation and under the current drilling boom it seems like we're really concentrating in this what, what the geologists would call the Bakken mature area and what that means is you know as the ancient ocean settled all of the sediment and as we've had the heat and pressure over millions of years create oil uh, this is the, the most mature or the hottest area, geology, and that's what made what the geologists would call the mature area. Of course, I always also like to say that people from Montreal and McKenzie County are more mature than other folks when I talk to the rest of the state here. They don't always believe me. Here. You guys are maybe all aware of this, but uh, at least people on the fringe area, I think one of the things that you should spend a little bit of time just in your own self-interest is go to the website of the North Dakota Industrial Commission, Department of Mineral Resources, and this is really your key as to what's going on in your county. Where the drilling's going on, where the permits are issued, which way the horizontal legs go on the wells that we see drilled, whose land is, you know, affected here. So this is a resource, and again, if you, if you don't have this website written down, that's fine. If you just search for the North Dakota Department of Minerals, uh, you'll find this. One of the most useful things there, of course, is it has the maps, if you can see uh, where all of the production is happening and the drilling is happening and so forth. It also has the daily reports of the new permits that are issued for McKenzie County or whatever county you're interested in. It's all on this page. So uh, most people need to spend a little bit of time there. We have about uh, 190 drilling rigs, I think, in the last couple of weeks. And again, you all aware that there's a lot of it in this particular area. One of the, I guess, uh, issues that we wanted to bring to your attention today, and you've maybe all thought of it here, you are veterans of the oil business, but this is a picture from that North Dakota Industrial Commission, the map server. And this is a part of the old Tioga oil field. You know, we started developing oil resources 50, 60 years ago in Tioga, but of course under the old technology, each of these represents a square mile. Look how many scattered oil wells that we had. We had in some cases eight or 12 wells in a section. Well, today we're gonna to have eight or 12 wells or more in a section, in a two section spacing, but we're not gonna space them out because you think about this, back then we had to have a road out to each one of these, tanks at each of these wells and so forth. And in the next picture, we'll show you now how we have changed some of that and we've become a lot more efficient. But one of the things that's affected you then is when you lease your minerals, it used to be that your lease probably spent a lot of time talking about the surface damages, reclamation, where they could put the tanks and the pipelines and all of that kind of stuff on the drilling site. Uh, that, was, that was important when we were developing an oil field like this. Now, if we switch to what the map looks like today, of course it varies in different parts, but this is an area, oh, I guess north of Newtown. Uh, I just picked this because there's a huge concentration. Now, instead of those scattered dots all around, we have, in this particular case, we've got one site here, we've got one pad, but we've got six different wells, and think how much more efficient that is. We have just one set of tanks, or one set of connections there, and uh, that has really changed how it works for the oil companies. But more importantly, for you as individual mineral owners, if you just have a small tract of land, chances are if your minerals are being developed, you likely won't have a well on your particular land. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of uh, surface acres, that's still a big issue. <laughs> but one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is that there's a lot of difference set between the mineral leases that we used to do because we were so concerned about the surface. Now we have a separate surface owner agreement that the oil company or the mineral developer is going to come negotiate with the individual farmer. 
So just to give you, you know, sort of a perspective, different oil companies have experimented with all different kinds of formations. Uh, there's a lot of these wells in this area that are uh, Hess wells, and this has been sort of their design now they come up with these kind of a pattern. Over this area, southwest of Stanley, south of Ross, this is all the whiting oil field. And instead of those kinds of things, they've come up with less of their multi pads here, multi little pads, but they basically figured out how to put all of their wells along the road. So we don't have to have roads out to each individual well because we've got the, road, the wells drilled pretty much along our main roads here. So it's changed how, <clears throat> how we as farmers and ranchers uh, deal with some of the surface issues because of how we're doing the drilling now. Just briefly, and I know back in the room you probably can't see this, but if you go to this Industrial Commission report, every business day it will list all of the wells that are being permitted. And you know, you don't have to be an oil man to figure it all out, I guess. But first of all, when we number our wells in North Dakota, these are consecutive from the first well, the Clarence Iverson well in North Dakota. So this was here current as of a couple of weeks ago. We've drilled roughly 25,000 wells in North Dakota, and everyone is numbered consecutively. Now we actually have about eight to 9,000 wells that are producing in North Dakota. So we've got quite a few that were drilled, were dry holes, or they drilled and produced, and they've since been abandoned. But uh, that's how many wells we've drilled since 1951, I guess. So again, most of you are familiar with this, but if you look at the daily permits, it's going to tell you that uh, this one here, for instance, was the Oasis Company, Oasis Petroleum. The well is named the Jenny Bond, probably a surface owner or some family member where the well site is being drilled. Uh, sometimes the oil company names it themselves. Sometimes they give the surface owner a chance, well, Nick, what name would you suggest? especially as we get multiple wells. Uh, it's going to give you the legal description, southwest corner of section 11. Uh, we actually, very precise, it's 540 feet from the south line of that tract of land, and it's 925 feet from the west line of that. So it gives us a pretty exact spot where that well is going to be. It's a development well, so it's already in a developed uh, field, the Willow Creek field. Uh, it's going to be 21,000 feet from the ground, down two miles, out two miles, and the total depth is going to be 21,000 feet, and it's going to be at an elevation of 2,100 feet, and then it has a federal American Petroleum Institute uh, number as well. So again, not that you, you know, are going to be concerned about every well that's drilled, but at least those that are drilled in your neighborhood, this is a wealth of information. And when you go to the bar or the coffee shop, you can appear very knowledgeable here that you know what's going on with the wells that are being drilled. One of the other things that a lot of folks from the rest of the state don't understand is the well produces a thousand barrels a day. Wow, they multiply that times the price. You guys are going to be billionaires out here. Well, a lot of cases, I suppose, mineral owners are. But all of these wells, at least the way we're doing it, with today's technology, have a huge decline curve. And what starts out as a 900 barrel a day well, again, you know, all kinds of differences here, but in about five years' time, is probably less than 100 barrels a day. And then it tapers off, and over the next 20, 30, 40 years, that's what we have to sort of base our income on, not necessarily the first year. So as I mentioned, uh, my organization, North Dakota Farmers Union, we've had a lot of interest, so we bring our bus out. Uh, we take, usually we've had you know, folks from the eastern part of the state, and since you can't find motel rooms for a whole bus full of people, we try and bring them out, see as much as we can in the day, take them back. And uh, usually we take them, uh, we'll start a lot of cases in the Newtown area, uh, look at some wells, some fracking sites, uh, various kinds of things there, saltwater wells, work our way up to Ross. Uh, a lot of you know the elevator in Ross has a big siding and they're unloading unit trains of frac sand. The rest of the state folks don't understand how all that all works. We've got a guy that steps on the bus and tells us about that. We usually work our way over to Tioga, 
got arrangements. We feed these folks uh, a noon meal at the man camp, which is a big deal for them. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different ones. We usually go to the Capitol Lodge one, 2,600 people at the Capitol Lodge man camp, and they do a nice job explaining it all. But they brag they are North Dakota's 14th largest city. Anybody think about that? <laughs> one man camp. So, and then we usually work our way over to Tioga, from, or back to Tioga, show up the gas plant, show up the rail loading facilities. We usually take them across country, up into north of Ross, uh, by area, take them out to the oil well, and of course it's a big deal for most of the rest of the folks in the state to get their picture taken by an oil well. So uh, we try to do that. This was the uh, early morning <coughs> company group that we brought up there. So anyway, you are in the midst of an area of a lot of interest for the rest of the state. Of course, we give them a little bit of warning. Fasten safety belts and remove ditch. It's not that bad. Safety, touching wires causes instant death, $200 fine. <laughs> so what do they see? Uh, just briefly, then, of course, a two-well pad. Uh, this was a big deal a few years ago. Rather than one well, we put two on a pad. That was a big deal nowadays your country as well, uh, six wells or even more are going to be the common way that we do that. And that has dip implications of how many people are going to participate with a surface owner agreement for, different from what they used to do. We try and show folks the fracturing, and again, most people have no idea the amount of water and sand that it takes to frack these wells. In a lot of cases, they don't understand the fact that the rural electric isn't immediately going to bring power, and the fact we have to have generators and engines and so forth running these wells, uh, sometimes a year or more. The other interest, of course, that's uh, a big deal for all of us, I think, is how much of our mineral income in the form of the gas is being flared. The Industrial Commission says roughly about 30% of the natural gas produced in North Dakota is now being flared. We're making all kinds of efforts to use up that gas, but the problem we have is the price of gas is literally pretty cheap and there isn't a lot of incentive for these oil companies to hurry up and build pipelines out to this. So we're st still seeing a lot of the flaring that goes on. Uh, I see there is some legislation that's been proposed this year of tightening up that. Generally the oil company has a year to flare it off then they have to go back to the industrial commission. And in most cases, they'll get another six months or another year, so we've been pretty lax with that. And again, a huge amount of resources, we could say, probably going up in flames. You've probably all seen this on the internet, but uh, if you look at weather satellites, uh, there's different pictures, but uh, you know, you can basically see in North Dakota, the lights of Bismarck light up, but this whole orange glow in western North Dakota is a combination of the natural gas plus all of the lights of the oil field. So flaring is a big deal. The other issue that I know you folks are dealing with uh, all the time, and we are up in Montreal County as well, is all of these smaller pipelines exiting out of the wells. Obviously, when we first drill a well, we have to truck away the oil, the salt water, the gas gets flared, and we have to try and deal with all of that. So eventually, then, we're probably going to end up with some of these gathering pipelines and we have a lot of farmers and ranchers that are dealing with these pipeline easements. Part of the discussion today, I think Dave will mention some of the concerns about that. Uh, lots of issues as far as farmers and ranchers go as to where they put the pipelines. Uh, maybe down here you don't have any rocks, but if in northern Montreal County, one of the things that we really have to specify in our pipeline easements is we want them to clean up the rocks afterwards because you know, we picked rocks for a lot of years there, dig up a pipeline and you got a whole bunch more rocks. So you got to deal with that. Closet your pipeline easement. And of course, one of the things that you hear about is there are a lot of issues with some of these big pipelines like Alliance and some of those huge long distance pipelines. But the State Industrial Commission, the State Public Service Commission now is starting to ex exert some influence on some of these smaller pipelines as well. And we're talking about three inch lines, four inch lines, plastic lines, metal lines, all kinds of configurations for the pipelines that will be going across your farm. A lot of cases of these gathering lines are 
they get all over the board, but the most common one in Montreal County is a pipeline company will negotiate with you maybe a 55 foot, 50 foot easement and up to four trenches or four pipelines within that 50 feet, pretty common. And even in the winter time now, obviously there's pipeline installation. One of the things that I think you have to talk about as a farmer is, are they going to come back a year from now and repack that? Because typically those pipelines have been settling, and again, dropping a tractor wheel in there or cattle stepping in there, there can be some real issues. So uh, again, get those in your clauses in your uh, pipeline easements. Another one is sooner or later, they're going to have to bring the pipeline up, have some valves and control structures and so forth. It's all right to negotiate these right inside the fence of a pasture, but out in the middle of a quarter section of good cropland, you don't necessarily want that. And typically those are somewhat negotiable as to where those above ground structures will be. The uh, other issue that I think is sort of important, and I think you've seen it here just like everywhere else, are co-ops. It's not like it used to be. You go into the co-op today, you probably don't know a soul. And they're doing a huge business. You go to their annual meeting, they pay a lot of money, but it's all from outside of farming and ranching. Not saying that the co-ops you know, aren't doing very well, they all are, but it's certainly different than what we're used to. <clears throat> we think about this, one of the questions that was asked about was, you know, do we want to go back to what it used to be? Different feelings on that. But this is the co-op at Stanley. It's so busy, just like yours is, I guess, but you can't hardly do business in there. Like they named themselves the Market Central there. But when we think about it, if we compare that to a few years ago, a few years ago, you, you know, people couldn't find jobs and things were kind of lean in farming and ranching. Now there's a sign in the window, you can't see it here, but it says hiring all shifts, all times of the day, even including weekends. So you could literally go find a job and they welcome you with open arms any time of the day. Most of our local businesses are overrun with trucks. We have some housing issues. That's a whole separate subject. Interestingly, people have told me now, I haven't had this experience yet, but when you negotiate a surface owner agreement that you agree to give them six acres, four acres for a well site, one of the clauses that you probably should include in there is that nobody can live on your site. Because technically the oil company, if they want to permit some of their folks to park their campers out there, if you don't necessarily have that exclusion in there, well, what are you going to do? So you might want to think about that. Or maybe you want to be in the housing business, but you'd want to do it on your own land rather than on the oil company's uh, acres and things right away. So part of what Dave's going to talk about this afternoon, mineral leases. You're probably in the area here where a lot of the leases are done with. The leases are being held by production, but on the fringes of our territory, that's still a big deal. Leases are being uh, allowed to expire. You're going to release them, and that would be the time to talk about how long the lease is, what the bonus is, what the royalty percentage is. The other thing then, as we continually change from single pads to multi pads, uh, these surface owner agreements, where you own the surface, you may or may not own the minerals underneath it, but those are a negotiable process. And again, it varies by oil companies, it varies by areas that you're in, but typically those are going to say, we're going to pay you a certain amount initially, an annual payment as long as there's an oil well there, or some companies have chosen that we're going to pay you a higher amount to begin with, and that's all you'll ever get. And then there's some renegotiable after a few years. So again, those are negotiations that you might want to think about. And then, of course, the other part of it is this pipeline easements and all kinds of things that you want to think about before you give easements for a pipeline. So I guess my closing words would be, we've got a lot of things to deal with. I sense that there's a lot of what we might call landowner and surface owner fatigue. We're tired of dealing with leases. We're tired of easements. We're tired of all of this kind of stuff. But yet the decisions that we're making today, first of all, the bonus and all of that stuff, and the initial production of the well is probably important to you. 
what we got to think about for the next 20, 30, 40 years is the royalty percentage and all of that kind of stuff. Your kids and grandkids are going to have to live with that. So let's do it right. Let's be educated. And that's part of why we're here today. So with that, questions? Just on that clearing off gas, you know, they said, well, they're not paying any taxes on it either. But is there a way you can uh, get for the mineral owner to get paid for some of that gas at least? as far as that's the best incentive for them to uh, finally hook it up. Well, as Dave will talk about here, that's going to be a negotiable thing as you, you know, a lot of us are beyond that, but if you're negotiating a new mineral lease at this point, you really need to put some provisions in there okay. after six months after yeah. first year, yeah. the yeah. mineral owner is going to get a percentage of that, there's going to be penalties, those are all negotiable. Sure. Just as a matter of a little bit of bragging, one of the projects that we've worked about at North Dakota Farmers Union, Myself and Mark Watney was this whole nitrogen fertilizer plant that's going to be built east of Jamestown. That's going to take 73 million cubic feet of natural gas a day. Oh. That, obviously, some of that's being flared, but in about three years' time after the construction period, we'll be making nitrogen fertilizer, anhydrous ammonia, and urea, and so forth. So we need more of those kinds of businesses, whether it's power plants or fertilizer plants or industrial kinds of uses, because we're going to be producing an increasing amount of natural gas for years and years and years. Sure. When will that plant be up? Uh, the, the CHS plant that was announced is going to start construction this summer. It takes about three years to build it, so 2016 before it produces the first ton of It's about 10 miles east of Jamestown. If any of you are familiar with the little town of Spiritwood, there's a big malting, malting plant out there. It's adjacent to that. There's a big gas line there? There is one gas line and they're negotiating to bring in a second one from the north because they want an uninterruptible supply of uh, gas. It'll be all three nitrogens in there. Urea. Produce anhydrous ammonia, urea, and liquid in. Anyway, let's get to the rest of the program and then maybe we can answer some questions here. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Dale. Next up, we're going to have Jean Vader, Economic Development Director for Mackenzie County, who many of you know very well. Um, I think the neat thing is a lot of you probably don't get to hear Jean talk very often. You know, we'll get to hear him at chamber things or different places like that. But um, we wanted him to come today to give a little bit of an update just on what he sees happening here in Mackenzie County. So he'll kind of do some of that. Um, he'll go over, there's also been um, some results shown on as far as production numbers, uh, population, different things like that that I think are pretty interesting. And then he might also go into some of the advanced technology that we might be seeing too after a while. So I'll bring up your presentation, but let's thank Gene for taking time to be here today. Thank you, Bob. You're gonna uh, enjoy that about half my presentation was just done, so <laughs> I have to go Sorry. through all that, that's all right. I'm the Economic Development Director, you know, I've been here for 18 years, grew up here. I'm going to talk pretty much about McKinsey County, though, because, uh, is this jumping by itself? Um, doesn't matter if I'm just going to show that first uh, photograph you saw there. Um, yeah, Reminds me that we're not 100 years old yet here. Well, so he's not 100 years old yet. So, as we're dealing with all of this stuff, and we're getting frantic about it, we need to recognize that most of this change has come in the last five years. And we're on the county level, we're trying to figure out how we're going to deal with the next 30 or 40 or 50 years. So we're already kind of jumping ahead of what you're seeing today. Um, those people there, uh, that's kind of what's left of Watford City, but those are the people that made the early decisions to make us what we are. So um, keep that in mind as we move forward on this thing. Kelly, did I just hit the arrow key here? Um, at the bottom, yep, arrow forward. Or enter, maybe. We jumped a long ways now. That's all right. Go back now. There we go. All right. It's just going slow for me. Okay. As we look today, I'm going to just ju jump some of these slides here. One thing that's coming up, and I'm going to jump quite ahead because you saw some of this thing. What we're dealing with today is trying to figure out, you know, what's happening on a national level with this oil thing. It's getting costly to produce in the Bakken. Uh, you know, so. Uh, what you not need to recognize is that this uh, technology that we're seeing, this hydrotechnology, hydrofracking technology, it's starting to open up a lot of other plays out there. 
The main ones that we're dealing with right now that, are, that, that some of the people are moving to are the Barnett and Eagleford Shale, and those are the Texas Shale plates. Um, they're a little less expensive to drill in right now, uh, mainly because of weather, availability of labor, and closest to the market. So you're seeing the Eagle Ford Shale and Barnett Shale, they're actually coming in and doing some hydrofracking in those areas. Uh, the, the areas in uh, Wisconsin, some interest out there. This is Marcellus Shale that you're hearing out there. This is where a lot of that fracking information that you're getting out there is coming out of this Marcellus Shale. That's pretty much a gas play out there. So uh, there's some real issues with hydrofracking out there, not so much in the local shale plays. But it looks to me like uh, if, if some of this stuff moves out of the area, it's going to move to Eagle Ford, the Barnett. Those are the areas that it's moving to right now because it's less costly to produce this. You'll also see this Monterey area, huge, huge volume of, uh, of available shale play out here. Uh, but there's a moratorium on fracking out here. There's also a moratorium on fracking in almost this area as well. So I expect as we're doing our planning, it leaves us this Bakken area. And uh, it is still one of the most prolific shale plays in the country. Um, so, you know, that's something that we have to remember when we're doing our planning. Um, I already saw that. You know, 7,800 wells were expected to be drilled in the next 15 years here. This is another thing that we show quite a bit. It's not a very good look at this right now, but that whole piece that you saw, uh, that whole Bakken play, remember, it's four counties. 85% of the production in the, the, the shale play comes on the McKenzie Mont Trail, um, Dunn and McKenzie. That's what, when we're in Bismarck, we're trying to explain, as they talk about North Dakota being an oil play, you got Dickinson down here, you got Minot up here, and you got Bismarck here. These people, we continually are fighting for them for our share of our impact dollars. And it's a, it's a daily challenge for us to understand that, that our agricultural community is trying to, to deal uh, on a positive side of all this play. But it's all happening here. So the second largest play in the United States right now falls within uh, these four counties, within about 70 miles, uh, a crow five miles, as Watford City. This is the old play down in Bowman, and this is the old play over in um, the Sydney area. Looks like the plays are moving now more probably over into Montana. We're not seeing, and this is just my speculation from talking to our mineral people. It's not moving too much outside this area. It, you know, everybody else, uh, they're worried about it up in this area, impacting so much, but it's so prolific here, it looks like it's staying in this area right now. Um, and uh, well, now I'm going to show you some projections because of that. You, you already saw this before. You know how the fracturing techniques work. Uh, this is a presentation I do quite regularly. You saw this. Here's something that is a little bit interesting, though. You know, here's your two-mile piece here. You know, you're going to have four or eight wells on, on each one. You know, there's your the middle bucket that they're producing from, and here's your three forks you're producing from. Something that hasn't come up too much, those of you up in that tobacco garden area, if you've been familiar with that Charlotte well up there, they're doing 1,140 barrels out of that particular well. That's the only one, and that's another three forks well. I'm not sure, but it's likely that they'll continue to do maybe two or three more wells in that formation there. This, as you know, in the last 18 months, uh, the Three Forks thing become kind of kind of a, a big deal. In fact, down in my area, they're all Three Forks wells. <clears throat> it's likely that we could even see another layer of production <coughs> based on what they're finding up there. Um, again, this is that spacing thing. I think the main thing that I wanted you to, to take away is we're doing our planning. The main thing to remember, that's a four section spacing that if you look over in the Montreal County, they're kind of getting more drilled up. Kind of what you need to think about is this is probably where we're at right now, that well and this well. That's about what we've drilled here. So if you're a planner here, you know that we've got maybe, maybe four, maybe eight, maybe even 12 more wells per, uh, per drilling unit. That's 1,280 acres. Uh, they'll do them on multi-paths. Uh, the good thing is if you live right here, life is pretty good. The bad thing is if you live right in this area, you are going to be in the middle of an industrial zone. And that's just, that's just how it's going to be. So, um, again, if you look at the old Blue Butte spacings up there, you know, when you go up to Blue Buttes, you'll see a quarter section of land that's got 30 or 40 wells on in that area. Those old units, it looks to me, the best way to look at that is when you get on top of Hill around Watford City. You'll see a mile north, they're starting to run that line. 
you'll see a mild sulfur starting to run that line. But that's the future. These wells here are the ones that we're planning for in our in our uh, in our planning right now. So I want to get to some numbers on that. You already see it how that looks. Uh, you know that looks. The thing that, that we talked about gas flaring, and one thing that we're finding out is the they're building gas plants around here, and they're making money off of gas. They're, they're flaring it, and they're waiting a little bit, but, but these gas plants right here, if you see what they've built, even in this area right now, we've got capacity in 2012 well beyond uh, what gas production is. So I, I'm hoping, and I hope if the state continues to push it, that we're going to get those gas, that gas into those if you look at McKenzie County right here, there's four major gas plants right within 10 miles of Watford City. Uh, that's what a lot of that activity was over the last year, is or last five years, is building those gas lines and building those gas plants. One Oak, as you know, did a $250 million gas plant. They're doing $150 million expansion right now. Uh, once that gas gets produced, that wet gas gets produced, it is worth money. Here's what they're looking at though for the future of the Bakken right here. This is the, I'm going to spend a little time on here. Here's where we are right now, 2010, 2015. It looks now we're about 800,000 to 900,000 barrels. It looks like we're going to be around that 900,000 barrels per day uh, out here, probably out till even out into 2055. But let's just take it to 2025. We know that we'll probably be there. Here's where here's where our proven reserves are. Here's probably we'll do it. We could be up to 13,000. The projections I looked at today, it, it looks like oil's going to stay up. It just looks like, you know, you, every time they find a new play out there, they find some other reason not to develop it. But this would be at, say, $100 oil, $90 oil. Uh, this would be where we're at right today. So uh, there's nothing to lead us to believe that we're not going to see some serious production over the next uh, 30 years. Here's what it means to us. You know, you have 150 to 200 rates, we're at, uh, uh, and McKenzie County has about 50 or 60 of those at any given time. Of those 150 rates, you have about 30,000 jobs, another 10 to 15,000 building infrastructure. Uh, one thing that has not been mentioned, these 200 rigs, you know, they're dropping a little bit, but as you can probably tell, those rigs are getting much more efficient, and uh, where they're drilling wells in, you know, uh, 20 days to 20 to 30 days, or even three years ago was 60, 60 days. So less drinks are drawing more wells. I, I keep looking at that rig count, and I can't believe that we even talk about it. It means, it means really nothing. What, what really means it, uh, is significant is the number of wells that are being drilled, and those continue to be increased. Right now they're behind um, on their fracturing. But we, we, we still are expecting 35,000 to 40,000 new wells out in this area. And I can guarantee you that they're not going to be anywhere other than Mackenzie, Dunn, Williams, and um, which one did I miss? Montreal. Here's what the here's what the profile. This is Lynn Helms's profile. It's a pretty easy thing to look at. Um, here's our years. Here's 2025. Here's where we are right now. 2010. We're about right here. The uh, the the dark maroon thing is the number of rigs that we're anticipating and the green is the number of wells that we're anticipating being completed. So we're looking at the drilling plans that they have out there right now going to 2025. With the, with the permits that are out there right now, um, you can expect that we'll increase, uh, at, we're at 2012 right now, so you know we're, we're probably at 60 rigs. We'll probably run there. It's going to drop a little bit down to about 50 just because there's other factors there, and that should run until about 2025. So I would say that we're best estimate we're kind of leveling out on our drilling right now, but um, the wells that come on are going to be, you know, moving out there to about 2050. That's what those was actually the wells are going to be producing out there, based on that remember that model that I showed you before. Here's what here's what uh, the bottom line on this, and you know I'm a I'm a rancher, so. You're trying to figure out, we're here to try to figure out how this impacts the farming and ranching community. Um, I guess the peripheral on that is that jobs come with that. And, uh, and jobs, the, the people provide a huge impact to us and it's something we have to deal with. But this is the real model we're working with right now based on what it takes to get this thing done. Again, here's 2012, we're about right here right now. You know, this is for the state of North Dakota. You know, about 38,000 jobs. It looks like till 2020, we're going to continue to build drilling. These are the purple is the drilling jobs. The, the uh, kind of, I don't know what color that is. 
It's a different kind of blue. That's what that's the fracking jobs. The lighter color is the gathering jobs. That's your oil pipelines. And then the, the green is the production jobs. So I always use the example of two of my son-in-laws. One works for Marathon. Uh, he's in production. One works for Halliburton. He's in exploration. Um, but the interesting thing about this is this, this exploration thing still stays pretty solid up there for the state. It doesn't completely drop off to any nothing. And everything tells you that all of this is going to grow and maintain above where we are right now. That's for the state of North Dakota. When you, when you go to Bismarck, they read that to believe that that's for the whole state. And you, you know that it's, again, for those four counties, right? It might be moving a little more south to Dickinson, but that's not been what they thought it was going to be. It hasn't got up to bottom like they thought it was going to be. This is just me talking to the industry people. It's done better over into Montana, but it's still sticking around here. This is what I deal with, though. Again, we're talking about eight to 9,000 jobs in McKinsey County right here, uh, and that's in the exploration industry. So that is, the exploration is um, drilling. Uh, all of the, the cement crews and the, the, all the chemical groups, uh, the water hauling, uh, anything that takes to drill a well, that's going to continue probably up to that 13,000 level, clear up to 2025. And these are based on uh, Lynn Helms's model, should, based on what we've already got permitted out there and what we know as a reserve. You'll also see the production jobs and gathering jobs at, at about 2000, I don't know, let's call it 2023, 24. We should have our pipeline infrastructure in, and we'd be done fracturing these jobs and we'll be re, and they'll level, up, level out about 2025. So somewhere around 10 years from now, we're going to see a level, leveling, but it's about where we are right now. So what does that mean for us? You know, for permanent housing, we're thinking that we're going to have about, uh, I think everybody you talk to thinks this is a low number, but this is based on the latest model that, I don't know, I guess, Ricky, you were in on it. The, the state, uh, well, and the gas impacted counties got together with the state and NDSU and did a real intensive study on what was really happening with the industry and took it to the legislature. So those decisions that are made, being made in the legislature right now are coming off this study that I just showed you. They did it for every county, but what you'll find out that study, if I showed you the, the complete study, was that McKinsey County is, uh, is in ground zero of this thing. Montreal County is, um, is they've, got a, they've been doing that up there for six or seven years, so they're probably a little further along. Um, but uh, this area looks like the growth is, is going to bring us up at least quadruple our size in maybe, who knows, eight to 20,000 is what they're looking at for 2036. I get asked it every day. I have no idea. Uh, it all depends on how many houses we get built. Houses get built based on these projections. Houses get built based on uh, what's happening in the other parts of the country. And I'll go over those things a little bit. This is a little bit interesting too, though, is what kind of jobs are out there. You know, the drilling jobs, the gathering jobs, the fracking jobs, those are those jobs that are in that kind of purple, the deep purple thing. If you look, we're 2012 right now, say 7,400 uh, drilling jobs, 549 gathering jobs, 1,500 fracking jobs, and 1,600 production jobs. We jumped on here to 2025. We went from 1,600 production jobs to almost 5,900 production jobs. So these jobs do take, they take, uh, uh, this Bakken takes a little more, uh, a little more work than some of the old oil fields did in terms of what it takes to keep them running. These numbers drop off as you get down here, but the production numbers stay in that about 8,000 uh, uh, job range. I, I don't know, I hope this is interesting. To, it's fascinating to me because it all, it all comes down to the boom and bust thing, which is really the, the question of the day, what happens with boom and bust? Um, I'm going to go in just briefly into some of the things that I see happening. Uh, There's this, what, what happens with secondary employment, the technology change, what happens with oil collection, wastewater, or water distribution pipelines, what happens with get natural gas, what happens with oil price dynamics, what happens with permanent residents, and, and do we crowd out other economic sectors? These are the big issues that we're dealing with. One thing that I'm finding out, I'm just going through this today, um, that I thought was pretty interesting. And it, and it involves the the things that probably have are issues to you is, you know, your, your survey said probably what most of us feel, we don't, we don't mind this oil thing, 
But I think if you're like me, you don't want it to wreck everything. And so the oil companies appear to be more interested in that than what you'd think. If you get outside this area, you go to Denver or you go to New York or you go to basically anywhere else in the United States, they don't like this. They don't like oil. They do not like it at all. And so, uh, you know, that's where our population base is. It could very well happen that uh, we'll wind up at a time where you can't hydrofrack. If that happens, then that changes everything. Um, so you kind of got to decide uh, at what level is it worth it. Well, what I'm seeing the oil companies doing, and I just pulled out three or four different things. In, in my mind, if I were a, if I were Randy Qualley, I saw him sitting back there. If I were investing right now, I'd be investing in green technologies because it looks like that's what's happening. You talk to these companies right now, they're aware that they could lose their abilities to fracture. What's the big issue with frac fracturing? It's the perceived issue that there's chemicals going into the water. It doesn't matter that that has not been proven, that it's here or not. That's, it doesn't matter what the public thinks is what matters. <clears throat> it looks to me like they're developing organic type materials that they're going to use for hydrofracking. If they do that, that changes everything. So that's part of that technology change there. I saw, for example, that Halliburton, for example, Halliburton has been using, uh, and this is just really recent stuff, so I don't know it by heart, but if you're planning here, Halliburton has got a, an enzyme that they're using now, and it's all, it's all chemical, it's all, it's used all chemicals, it's all organic, and um, if, they, if they do something that's called clean stem, and it's using fruits and vegetable enzyme enzymes, and that's what basically replaces all the chemicals in the, in the fracking uh, chemicals that go down there. If they do that, then that changes the whole scenario, and it's basically what we asked for, is you don't want to see those chemicals. In my mind, the biggest challenge for chemicals right now is not in the fracturing piece, it's putting them on trucks and driving them by my house, and, and the truck tipping over and getting into my water or whatever, but, you know, or just the trucks on the highway in general. Um, Schlumberger is, yeah, they're experiencing a fracking material that has, uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's a fiber, it's taking fiber, agricultural fiber, and, and combining it with their frac fluids, and that's an organic technique that they're using already too, and um, Halliburton is using, their, so what they're trying to do to reduce their numbers of trucks is they're actually reducing, they've got a, uh, if you think about Time is money in the oil field, if it takes you eight days to frack a well, or 12 days to frack a well, and you can cut that down to three, uh, that's, that makes some money. I see what they're doing now is they're rolling out a, you know, as you know how, you know how fracturing works, they have a sending a series of balls that go down that line to, to, to hold off the pressure. And you'd have to drill through that and retrieve that ball, and that's what takes all the time. They're using our organic material that they can, um, they can, uh, it, it dis disintegrates after I think uh, 12 hours or 8 hours. So they run the ball down there, the hydrofrack, and that disintegrates. So they could, I think they cut 30% off the time of fracturing a well. Um, and they're also doing sliding sleeves, so instead of, instead of running explosive down there, they're pre-perforating the, the, the well and then they slide the sleeves. Those are things that are happening today. Uh, so I think that what you're going to find out is that the biggest driver on this industry is probably money, and, and if, if these companies are seeing that this uh, hydrofracking is a, a problem clear to the presidential level, that they have to fix it, because uh, public perception is what drives that. Um, also, the development of water and pipelines, you know, those are things that just have to get built out to get trucks off the road. I think most of the surveys that we have found have been the biggest fatigues. Uh, that we're finding on our citizens, the biggest fatigue factor is traffic. And so, you know, we can only build roads as fast as we can build them, but you just have to reduce traffic, and it's truck traffic. And the only way you can do that with is pipelines. The pipelines are the things that companies need you to participate in. They're the ones that impact you the most. Uh, and um, so there you have it. You, you can't do without it, but uh, if a thousand citizens want a pipeline that's running across the front of your yard, you're the one that has to deal with it. So I think that's why our next presenter is going to talk about that. How do you deal with it? You might philosophically like it, but if it's changing your way of life, it's not, not such a great deal. Um, what we're trying to do around here is a shift towards permanent residence. We don't know. When, we, when they did that study, is a job 
Is a job a house, or is a job somebody who who comes here from Denver for two weeks and flies back for two weeks? And all that, and when you're building communities, you got to know that. Or you know, where we all said we don't want to go through what we did before, where people come, take our resource, and leave. Um, so that's where we're getting into the the housing that we're building and trying to figure out a way to keep our people here. And that's that's what we work with on a daily on a daily basis. And I probably won't get into that at length. That's part of the presentation, but. Uh, crowding out of other economic sectors. One challenge that Kelly and I, when we talked about doing this, and, and believe me, I appreciate you recognizing the ag community in this. It's one part of the community that might get left out. Is what happens when it gets easier to not farm or not ranch? Like it gets, to, you get too. It's happening up in Montreal County where there's just too too much activity and people are leaving. But what happens when it's easier to just leave the land idle or or walk away because uh, we all know what the we know all about the economics of farming and ranching. I, I hear people just I got it the other day is what happens when you've just you farmed three quarters on the other side of Highway 85 and your farm's on the other side of 85. There's a point where you just say I'm not going to do that anymore, and then who picks that up? And I don't know what's going to happen with that, but I do believe that that's a traffic thing, and some of the technologies of bringing these wells into eco pads and getting them. Uh, into quarters is going to help. Uh, one one company that's dealing south of uh, Arnegard a year ago told me their long range plan though is to have no visible uh, equipment on a well pad. And what they'll do is what they're planning on doing is recycling all their water, not having any tank batteries on their well pads. And um, he asked me specifically, this is a big company, would there be a a thirst for irrigation water in that area south of Arnegard. Well, it's perfectly irrigable land. I, I kind of chuckled about it, but then I look at this note today, and uh, pop, probably 80% of the companies right now are looking at recycling their water to a, a not potable, but water that would be uh, able to be irrigated on. So I said, well, how are you going to do that if you have a well on every quarter section? He said, your pivots will be able to go over top of the well heads. So, uh, if you're in my position, that's what you want to do is look at 20 years down the line, where's that going to leave? Because I don't want to lose agriculture. But that would be fairly exciting. The first thing that I wanted to do here when I came here is, is get these lands irrigated, and it's been a long old, old process. So, you know, the other the shift towards permanent residence and crowding out of the economic sectors, if you, you know, you'll see it already if you're, if you're a small coffee shop or, or grocery store or whatever, if their value of their property is far beyond what they can make off that property running the coffee shop, then it becomes uh, maybe some other business and you lose your coffee shop. Well, if you believe in the free market, you just gotta let that happen, but that's what's going on. Here's something that's kind of interesting too, I just threw this in at the end. When, when you're looking at the Bridger Pipeline did a presentation, this is the reality of one oil well uh, when you drill a well for 15 years of its life, 72% of that oil is moved by truck. It has been historically, and that's what we're trying to get to with pipelines. That's kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, how do you get it into pipelines without impacting everybody? We don't want trucks, we want pipelines. I've asked 100 farmers and 100 pipeline companies how they want to do it. Some like corridors, some don't like corridors. Uh, I think the reality to me is having some muscle to return the land the way it's supposed to be returned. I think that's where the, as a landowner myself, I don't mind a pipeline, but it better look like it did 10 years ago. But, and, you know, that's it. It's all oil coming out of there. 16% of it's water, or 16% uh, of it is frack water, which is a short-term piece of that, and that likely will get piped in and out of there too as we go. So anyway, it's gonna last a long time, 5,000 producing wells today. 2,100 wells per year, 50,000 wells left to drill. Each well will produce 30 to 50 years. And we go back to that original. I, I don't know, that's, I just wanted to, I think that kind of covers what I wanted to cover, is it, we all come down to, when I'm, dealing with the, when I'm dealing with the developers that want to come in here, or the state of North Dakota that, you know, I'm not fighting with the state, but they're trying to fix the road. Two sessions ago, they said, why would you want to do that? There's nobody up there. Then last session, they said, well, it's getting kind of busy up there, isn't it? And now we're building roads in the middle of the, of the well. So we do know this stuff. 
the stuff is out there, and we're not, we don't work in a vacuum. Well, companies don't work in a vacuum. Your, your county and city officials don't work in a vacuum, but uh, it's been hard to get the state to keep up with this, and, and my, what I want to leave you with is you need to apply pressure to it. I think you need to apply pressure in the fact that it's not a state thing. It's McKinsey, Montreal, Don, and Williams County. That's, that's where the impact is. It's right there. I don't see any oil wells out here. I, I see nothing out here but right in here. So we're, we're, I'm very optimistic about what I can do for us, but, um, but I want to do it not at the expense of every, every other citizen here, too. So how am I doing, Kelly? Great. Rick, can I keep my job? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think the next part of your, probably most of you are here for the next part of the, the, the presentation about what do you do as a landowner to deal with this. So I'll give this back to Kelly. question. Yeah. In Arnold Gardens area, what are they talking for getting the water? Are they going to RO uh, salt water? Yeah, the, the things, his, his question is what do they do with uh, about this water thing is it's already happening. And I would say probably in two or three years you'll see 30 or 40 percent recycling water. And it's not because they love you, it's because it costs too much. You know, I mean, I, I found that out. It's, it's not, it's just it, that they recycle it. There's a thing I wanted to mention, though. You still got to do something with the salt. You know, it's, the fresh water is fine, but you still got the salt. That's still going to have to go to injection wells or something. One of the things that happened in the state that's really we've seen an impact, in, and uh, your commissioners can tell you that, is when they closed open, pat, open pits on pads, that sounded like a good deal. But now what they have to do is they have to find a place to take that, uh, that uh, waste. And so what you're seeing in McKinsey County is open pit landfills. That's a real issue. You know, everybody, nobody wants an open pit in the oil well, but they gotta take that somewhere, and they are, they have technologies to do it, but it does take 30 and 40 acres, and it could be next to your house. So there's a whole bunch of other issues there too. But yeah, they're re they're recycling water. Is there any issues on trying to get rid of all the disposals on your land then? Uh, from the oil, from the oil companies. Is that ain't, yeah. Well, they like that ain't, but not. yeah, the, they they still have to do some with the salt, and um, so we're we're not. You're hearing some things about disposal wells. Um, not from the industrial commission. That would be the environmental community that would probably try to keep that from happening. Is, am I answering your question? Well, kind of, sort of, but you know, like putting the investment up on Kelter's land, you know, just south of Indian yeah, Hill, yeah. the monstrous hole they've got in the ground. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's that. I'm just like six miles away, and we could not force little oasis to go ahead and take the dry cuttings up there. Uh, it's cost too much. Well, yeah. I don't want to dispose on my land. Yeah. And then, okay, we, we agreed to put multiple pits on. In the same mm -hmm. unit on one one site, yep. and it says let's put tracer wire wire yep. on so we can find it again. So they yep. agreed to that, but uh, there's no way I could force them into this. That might be, again, that's that. a good question for the gentleman yeah. back here. But it, but they what he's it. talking about is two different kinds of waste. Yep. One is production water, you know, and one right. of it is the solid waste. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, this the production water that hasn't been too much of an issue for salt water disposals, but that that uh, that's. Uh, drilling solids that they used to bury on your land. Now, you don't want that either. That's another challenge. I, I can't believe we got away with covering that up. Uh, I'm sure that that will come back on us someday. Yeah. But it is, I don't know the legalities of how you do that. But that would be a contract item you should save for the next speaker. How would you like how I dodged that? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, that included the pit liner went in there too, didn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah the world has changed quite a bit. It is greener, but so go to Randy and invest in green technologies. That's where it's at, if you ask me. So. Can I uh, ask something on the But I've been, I got a real peeve. All the one calls going in, and I was going to try to get a drug bill and see if we could uh, adopt a bill. I got a real peeve with pen flags <laughs> all over our county. Yeah. Remember at a county level, we could put up ordinance or some kind of. Yeah, I don't use, know. Use wood Should you have to or take something. Them all, yeah. What, yeah. He said, what he said is, and it's a real question is, uh, and, and I'll just use it from, well, I can't imagine that, not that thousands of one calls a day. After every time there's a construction project, every utility, every phone, every electrical, every water, every oil has to have a, and they have to flag them. So what's happened? What his question is is what happens? They put the flag in there. They're supposed to leave them for six 14 or eight, days fourteen days, but then nobody's responsible for removing them. So they say they will, yeah. but uh, I don't know, I know in Canada is. in the, their Queensland and stuff they're illegal. Yeah, but you know, use wood or something biodegradable, because we combine two or three of them. 
Okay. And we try to avoid them like the plague. We don't know where they went. That's a, that's a good issue. I don't have an answer for you on that, but yeah. Could do it as a county level. Well, I, I talked to <coughs> some of them that do it. They're supposed to pick oh, them up yeah. when they're done, but they just don't. And I told them, you know, it's enforced somehow, they won't. Yeah, they're not any good after those 16 days. Yeah. So. And I worked with REC, I told them they do have some plastic ones available. Yeah, if I, and there, there's a landowner question, but yeah, but I would say that would be one of those things you can say as a landowner. You can come across this land, but it, you know you need exactly. To, but yeah. the rental stuff is where we have big trouble. Yeah. With. But that's going to be the only way you're going to control that. I think. Yeah. Other questions for me? I'll answer some at the end here. But the, the real guy is coming up here, so I'll give this to Cal. Okay, let's thank Jean again for spending. Some time. Okay, and I think we're actually going to take. Um, David is going to be our last speaker, but we're going to take a quick little 10 minute break or so. So you guys help yourself to some coffee, cookies, use the restroom, um, and then we'll get started back up shortly with David Sikowski from NDSU. Better understand it. 